Thank you. My name is Josh Brzezinski. Thank you for coming. My talk is called The Future of Google Search and Ethics. Um, so people argue about control over the physical internet, the uh, ISPs and devices we use. Access to this layer of the net is important, but it's not the only layer. What's much more important and much more overlooked is control over the access to the information layer. In other words, search. The information layer of the net is a little bit like the realm of Plato's forms. Like the physical layer, the information layer is also built to be a multiplicity of nodes. Trillions of documents owned by millions of people, dispersed, democratic by design. But, despite the safety inherent in such a dispersed system, there is also a vulnerability. Search companies do not physically control the internet. They can't, as much as they may try. Again, built from the ARPANET of old, both the physical and information layers were built to be dispersed as a security feature. So that is hard to take control of by any one entity. But that dispersal is also the security vulnerability. Although our internet addresses are all cataloged in an open source way, the information is not cataloged in an open source way. Private corporations were only too happy to collect all of our information for us so that they could be the sole point of access. As a result, search companies like Google have become the de facto standard. The indispensable public search engine we use on a daily basis to Google whatever it is we need. The problem is, this has put a for-profit, private, unregulated corporation in an unprecedented social position. They're now in the position to secretly record our private thoughts and desires, to sell to marketers, or to give to government, as various critics have already voiced concern. <laughs> They're now in the position to destroy other businesses, or even entire business markets, by simply removing them from the search results and take increasing portions of our economy over as has been the subject of numerous Federal Trade Commission lawsuits. But however unethical, I'm going to argue that's not even the real problem. Even more fundamentally than all of this, search company employees simply now have the ability to censor that which offends them for their own personal reasons, never mind any business reasons. Not only those businesses or business models that compete with them for the ever-increasing internet dollar, but any other kind of website that, to quote numerous Google employees, they think just doesn't belong on the internet. This is actually the worst kind of censorship, the hidden censorship indignantly conducted by a private autocracy that just does not see their position as self-appointed corporate censor of the internet as any kind of problem. So maybe the EU has it right. Maybe we should regulate search companies through government. Perhaps surprisingly, I'm going to argue the answer is no. Because regulations are just not strong enough. Our public search engine doesn't need to be regulated against corruption. Our public search engine needs to be built in such a way where corruption is not even an option. Like the internet it provides access to, our search engine also needs to be democratic by technical design. Liberal democratic principles needs to directly control who gets censored or not and why. And regulated government and not-for-profit organizations needs to control and divvy out search access. In other words, we don't just need to regulate search companies. In much the same way that the U.S. gutted AT&T in the 80s, 
for having too much control of another access system, we actually need to make it illegal to have a private censorship system of any data for the public welfare. This is the only just way in our society to decide who gets censored and why. How did we get here? Back in the 90s, a privately controlled search engine was innocuous because the internet was only a novelty. This time has long passed. The writing is on the wall, or on the sweatshirt. <laughs> the internet is our global communication, information, and commerce platform. Very few buying decisions occur today without touching search at some point in the sales funnel. Yes, they may hear about the product or service somewhere else, like in TV or social media, but it's in search that they will research it. They will research what it is, who are its competitors, how much does it cost, or finally just where to find it. In just the time it takes me to say this sentence, according to Google's own website, they will have responded to over a quarter million search requests that's 40,000 searches per second, every second, which all adds up to over 100 billion searches per month. The first world relies on search, and the second and third will too, if Google can pump out free phones to them fast enough. Now, this is not just an invective against Google. Both Apple and Amazon are jostling to get a piece of the search pie. And then, not to be outdone when there's a monopoly at stake, there's Microsoft's Bing. And Facebook has pledged to get into web search as well, that is, if they still exist in 10 years' time. <laughs> so we may end up not having one company in the access monopoly, but three or four. In fact, Google loves to trot out this argument, to try to prove that they don't have the monopoly on search. Well, that is, when they can be bothered to respond to us with actual words. <laughs> the arrogance of Google notwithstanding, the fact that we might end up with more than one private sensor in the access monopoly doesn't matter. Because three or four are just as bad. In fact, even worse because now it provides the fake appearance of diversity and choice. Don't like Google censorship? Okay, all right. Well, you can settle for Microsoft's, or maybe Facebook's. Either way, a petty autocracy still governs access, whether a petty government <laughs> gets involved or not. <laughs> Sorry, I guess I should have warned you that some images may be disturbing. He's actually red. We need to reboot our thinking from the ground up. As it turns out, a private company cannot and should not ever have been allowed to own the access to this internet thing. Because the information layer is a public resource. Information is infrastructure, as important as phone or travel. Would you trust a private, for-profit, unregulated corporation to maintain their own governmental safety standards internally for this infrastructure? Would you let a private corporation own this infrastructure? Basically, let a private corporation own and maintain the entirety of our worldwide road system, connecting every building to every city on the planet? Let them process their own traffic laws internally in their own secret departments for which you have no right of representation and no right to appeal their verdicts. Let them, I don't know, bar certain vehicle types they don't like, mostly the ones cost them too much money in maintaining their road system. Of course, they'll advertise on their road system however they see fit because after all, they own it. I don't know, let them surreptitiously control the flow of traffic to the businesses or business sectors through the light systems that they prefer for whatever professional or simply personally biased reasons. 
And when we inevitably complain, will we let them rather indignantly insist that, well, they have the right to do with their road system whatever they want. I mean, they built it, they own it, they maintain it, right? It's their private public road system. If users don't like Google Roads, TM, <laughs> users are always free to switch to Bing bike lanes or they can use Yahoo walking paths. No? This is not seeming like a great idea. You feel our existing transportation rights are too integral to the happiness of our lives? You wouldn't let a private corporation completely own and govern the physical access to our communication and commerce? Then why do we let a private corporation control and govern the digital access to our communication and commerce? Doing all of the unjust things I just mentioned, every single one, but this time behind the scenes on the digital side. In the end, Google maintains they're just another website. And they have the right to do with their website whatever they want. But that is just another PR smokescreen. That is not and never was the issue. It was never about these websites, but always about the people who rely on them. Even if Google maintains the right to do with their website whatever they want, that does not or should not Give them the right to do whatever they want with other people's lives. I repeat, we've made a mistake. We should never have allowed a private corporation to be in the position to quietly censor anyone, never mind potentially everyone, whether we personally agree with every single website they've decided to censor thus far. Yes, Google can do whatever they want with our websites. But they can't use freedom of speech as an argument to justify destroying the livelihood of others. If freedom of expression was so important to Google, you'd think they may allow it for people in their system. And so this TED event is supposed to be about transforming our future. And as it turns out, in the future, we have to listen to the past. Consider for just a moment the evolution of our systems. Um, democracy 1.0 is democracy in its purest form, simple vote. If the majority voted to murder Plato's teacher Socrates, which they did, then Socrates got murdered. He had no rights in the system protecting him against majority rule. Okay, seeing this liability amongst others, various founding fathers invented rights, thus ushering in Democracy 2.0, the liberal representational democracy. Citizens now have liberal rights in the system. And the democratic body is governed by a representational government, but only for a term. Why? Why these enhancements? Because it's safer this way. They saw the need to put checks and balances in place to protect the system against us and not merely against greed, but against something far more insidious, the human species' perpetual moral certitude. But, however good it's been, I'm going to argue that Democracy 2.0 is already over. And it wasn't Google or Microsoft or Facebook, or even Trump, that killed it. <laughs> At least not yet. It was us. We killed it. Because we radically altered Democracy 2.0 when we unplugged and uploaded the lifeblood of any political system. When we uploaded the brunt of our communication, our business to consumer commerce, and our information to that internet thing. For the Founding Fathers never could have foreseen that instead of asking our friends what to buy, that in some far-flung future time, we would ask something called a Google, and it would give us the answers naturally that it preferred. 
thus circumventing their existing protections. So I have one final argument for you. <laughs> we know that shifts in the political sphere can usher in new technological paradigms. But I am going to argue that the process also works in reverse. Paradigm-altering technological changes usher in paradigm-altering political changes. It did for the nuclear age. It caused the Cold War paradigm. And it will for the internet age as well. The only question is, which way will we shift? Right now, left unprotected. Our unprotected technological system is actually allowing for more autocracy. In this case, autocracy 2.0. A weaker form of autocracy, I'll admit, but autocracy all the same. Basically, it's a cabal of unregulated corporations, only too happy to offer up a nice hot plate of digital plutocracy, replete with completely hidden censorship. Where most everybody does rely on these private internet autocracies, but only the people who've been hurt by their system realize how they work, and those tragically idiotic few who are trying to warn other people about it. Or will we put the requisite protections in place and thus evolve to democracy 3.0? The same good old liberal representational democracy, but this time with digital checks and balances and digital structure in place to cover our new digital commerce, communication, and information platform. Regulation is a start, but it's just not enough. We cannot let private corporations govern key technological political systems. They can't be left to make their own editorial decisions here. As a society, we need to realize that information is a public resource. It's data for the public welfare. And it is nothing but a hurtful and dangerous conflict of interest to allow a private for-profit corporation to govern key public resources. The entire underlying structure of your democracy needs to remain democratic. That is, if you want to have a democracy, otherwise you don't. You have an autocratic entity which has found a loophole, an exploit, to exist in the otherwise democratic system, all under the guise of being free, benign, and friendly. If this is the case, then surprisingly, the EU suing Google over anti-competitive behavior, which hardly anybody knows about, is actually the sharp edge of this political epoch shift. The dying gasp of Democracy 2.0's insufficient immune system, trying to fight off what it sees as an autocratic cancer. The result of this debate will very soon go one way. Or, more than likely, the other. <laughs> Either way, it will obviate our need to argue about control. Thanks. Sorry, quick plug. If you want to learn about how Google is hurting people, please watch my upcoming documentary called Don't Be Evil, Google's Secret War, and watch my upcoming book called The Zombies, or simply follow me on the Twitter sphere for updates. Thank you. <laughs>